My name is Stephen Groves. I'm a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and I'm just going to be kind of moderating the panel today. We're joined by uh, three panelists uh, from across the, um, I would say, the conservative or skeptical uh, side of this debate to talk about what's going to be happening over in Paris at the end of the year and uh, what the impact is back here at home on several issues that you guys are probably more familiar with uh, than the treaty, like uh, the clean power plan and the heavy truck regulations and methane emissions regulations and so forth. But the, the reason why those are going to become more and more relevant is because what the president intends to do at the end of the year at this, this two-week uh, climate conference in Paris is to negotiate an international agreement, an agreement that he's not calling a treaty, by the way, but just like the Iran deal, this is going to be another executive agreement uh, that doesn't require any congressional input at all. Now, this is a very unprecedented step for a president to take because in the past, every major environmental um, agreement that's been made out there uh, has always been brought to the Senate uh, for advice and consent. Uh, or at a minimum, has been submitted to Congress as a congressional executive agreement, which would require both houses to vote on it and give it majority vote approval. That's not what the president's going to be doing with this uh, agreement that we're just calling the Paris Protocol for short. And um, so he's going to completely bypass Congress. He's not going to submit it to the Senate. He's not going to submit it to the House. Um, and then he's going to go straight to enforcing it by uh, enforcing the regulations that, uh, like the Clean Power Plan and the other ones I mentioned. Uh, so this is, this is a very strange thing uh, for any presidents to do, but this, the, the current president, uh, this is explicitly what he plans to do. And the, the strange thing about it is that then he will then turn to the House, where all appropriations must, uh, must originate, and ask House members to fund tens of billions of dollars every year to something called the Green Climate Fund. So you might ask yourself, how is it that he's going to go and make all these international commitments to 190 countries in Paris, completely ignore the House, completely ignore the Senate, and then come back to you uh, and ask you for tens of billions of dollars every year to fund the Green Climate Fund? That's something that you might want to ask your, your bosses about because it's those authorizations and appropriations bills that are going to be coming across uh, their desks to vote on uh, down the road. Um, so just with, with that in mind is kind of the, um, the backdrop of what to expect at the end of the year. Um, I'm going to introduce the first of our uh, first three panelists here uh, to go into more detail about what's going to go on in Paris and what the impact back here at home is going to be. Uh, in, the, in the middle of the table is uh, Stephen Newley, who will be our first uh, speaker. Uh, he's the Vice President for Climate and Technology at the Institute for 21st Century Energy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, previously, Steve served as the Department of Energy's Policy and International Affairs Office under President George W. Bush, where he represented the DOE as part of the U.S. government's delegations the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the, the group that's going to be doing the conference in Paris, as well as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, that produces the, their global warming reports, and the G20 and other organizations. His experience also includes stints on the House Science Committee, so you're familiar with these, these, uh, these rooms, and as a consultant uh, to the Energy Information Administration which is always a great resource I always turn to. So uh, Steve, uh, please take it away. I think we're going to confine our comments to, um, our prepared comments to less than 10 minutes a person, and then we'll open it up uh, to Q&A uh, for everyone. Until that time, please uh, help yourselves to seconds so the Chick-fil-A is there for you. We're just gonna go give it up to our interns if you guys don't need it, so. Uh, Steve. Thanks, uh, thanks, Steve, and it's great to be here. Uh, I've been asked today to talk to you a little bit about the U.S. Uh, pledge uh, in the international negotiations. It's an intended nationally determined contribution, uh, otherwise known as the INDC, and also to give you an idea of some of the scale and scope issues uh, surrounding heat emission cuts uh, globally. And so we're going to go to the first slide now. Yeah, so, so this is uh, what the U.S. 
uh, submitted as part of its INDC to the UN Framework Convention. So this is in the United States, the Obama administration's pledge. Uh, and you can see at the bottom the green and the purple dashed lines. Those are the 26 and 28% goals by 2025 that the administration said the U.S. is going to be able to achieve. Now, there's a couple of things you have to understand about the goal. This is a greenhouse gas emission goal, a net greenhouse gas emission goal. So not only does it include carbon dioxide, it includes the other five greenhouse gases, and it also includes uh, either uh, emissions or sinks from what's known as loose F. Land use, land use change, and forestry. Now, why does that matter? Uh, because in the U.S., land use and land use change takes about 900 million metric tons of carbon emissions off the table. So uh, the U.S. is actually a sink, so we'll lower our emissions considerably. So when you look at the, the, this, uh, this chart here, those da da dashed lines are the goals of net greenhouse gas emissions the administration says the U.S. is going to be able to achieve uh, by 2025. Go to the next slide. <coughs> All right, so uh, the U.S. goal is a 26 to 28% reduction in net greenhouse gas emissions from the baseline year of 2005. This is the baseline year. Uh, you can see in 2005, uh, net emissions were about close to about 6.4 gigatons. A gigaton is a billion metric tons, so about 6.4 billion metric tons greenhouse gas emissions. So by 2025, the administration is looking at uh, an emissions, emission profile for the U.S. of about 4.6 gigatons, which leaves an emission reduction of about 1.8 gigatons, 1.8 billion tons to achieve by 2025. So that's the baseline. And the next slide I'm going to show you is just uh, an enhanced version of that gray white slide. So Matt, let's go to the next slide, please. Now the, the next one. Oh, up. Up again, again. No, we got a good one. Third, keep going. That's it. Is there a missing slide? There's a missing slide. I'm sorry about that, folks, but I will tell you about the missing slide. Okay. Uh, anyway, so what I did was. I took a look at what the administration has proposed uh, as part of its plan to achieve its 28% reduction by uh, 2025. So I look, took a look at a few things. I took a look at the uh, U.S. Coal Power Plan, uh, the administration's proposed uh, emission reductions from oil and gas systems, the USDA land programs, the EPA SNAP program, which takes a uh, look at hydrofluorocarbons, the landfill methane program, uh, the heavy truck cafe, appliance standards, and emissions. It's next to It's the one What happened? It was there. It, it was, was there. there. Can you go full? There it is. There it is. Oh, there, there it is. is. <laughs> uh, so I, I took a look at all those programs, and the administration has provided estimates for some of these programs. And some of these programs I can come up with my own estimates. But when all is said and done, when you start adding up of the administration's programs, to fall about 800 million metric tons short of the 28% goal by 2025. That's about 45. That's about 45% of the entire pledge. So uh, what I mentioned earlier, the pledge of about um, 1.8 million metric tons, 800 uh, million metric tons is about 45%. So there's still a long way to go. And when you read the IAM, you see it's very interesting. They don't mention the industrial sector at all. So they don't mention refineries, they don't mention steel plants, they don't mention aluminum plants, they don't mention cement plants. So what we've been telling the folks in the industry is that you may not be experiencing any regulation now, but regulations are going to come because they have to get those from somewhere. Another area they're going to get regulations from uh, uh, airline, the airline industry. They, they really covered pretty much everything they can in the transportation sector. The only thing that's left is the airline industry. And then the third thing is what I mentioned earlier, lose stuff, land use, land use. There are some land use programs in the administration's uh, portfolio, but not nearly enough. So the question is, and the question we've been posing to a lot of the uh, international negotiators from various countries is how are we just going to meet this goal? I think you know, within a year and a half, actually by Paris, the administration should come up with some credible plan to get this 800 uh, million metric ton reduction that they need to achieve the president's 28% goal by 2025. And all this assumes, of course, 
you know, what the administration is proposing is actually legal. I mean, uh, the uh, clean power plan was just published in the Federal Register Friday. There have already been court cases filed. Uh, lawyers that I have talked to feel very confident that, at minimum, uh, the, clean, uh, the clean power plan will not get through the courts on the scale that it changes the clean power plan. So this, again, throws a, throws a whole slew of questions out there about how the administration expects, uh, expects to achieve the goal. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, I've added the, these, uh, the two dotted lines to this chart. This is the chart that originally appeared in the IAPC. You can see, uh, you can see the, the, the dashed line is what the uh, business as usual, usual projection would be, and the dotted line is uh, the administration's programs to date. So you can see it still sold. It falls far, far short of where the administration needs to go by 2025. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, I've also been asked to give you an idea of uh, what some of the issues are uh, in the international negotiations and what some of the proposals that are out there to reduce global emissions. And this is one of them. This is one from the EU. When you hear talk about, uh, about emission reduction goals at the UN Affirmative Convention, it's always couched in terms of we have to meet two degrees. Now, for most people, two degrees means about 450 parts per million uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere or uh, uh, another way to express this would be about a 60% reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So that's what this chart, chart shows. Uh, this chart shows where global emissions were in 2010, where they would be if they were unconstrained in 2050, and then we would have to get emissions in, in 2050 to achieve that 60% uh, reduction in global emissions. So you have to get, emissions would have to move from about 48 uh, gigaton globally, greenhouse gas emissions, to about 19.4 uh, by 2050. We go to the next slide. I'm going to tell you this is virtually impossible to achieve. And see, this is kind of a very complicated, and, and here's why. You see the two bars on, on the left-hand side? Those represent uh, emissions from developed countries, that's blue, and where emissions would be if they were unconstrained in 2050. Red bar is emissions in developing countries in 2010, and where those emissions would be in 2050. <coughs> so what I did was a thought experiment. I said, okay, imagine that developed countries cut their emissions to zero by 2050. That's not going to happen. Just imagine that emissions from the United States, from Europe, from Japan, Japan, Australia, all those countries were zero in 2050. How much would developing countries have to cut their emissions to achieve a 50, uh, 60 percent reduction by 2050? And that's what it looks like. Emissions in the developed world would have to be lower than they were in 2010 to be able to meet a 60% uh, reduction by 2050. I got to tell you, that's not going to happen. Uh, developing countries are building coal plants for the band, and they're not going to be able to achieve this. So we need, uh, another way to look at this is to, to think that 2010 to 2050, let's take a snapshot for those two years, all the energy all the incremental energy between 2010 and 2050 in the developing countries would have to be zero emission. That's not going to happen. We we'll go to the next one. This is the exact same chart, except I'm showing you per capita uh, emissions here. It's the same story. The capita emissions in the developing world by 2050 would have to be lower than they are today. And it's even if developed countries cut the emissions to zero, which is not going to happen. No developing country is going to agree to this. Chinese emissions right now are probably about seven tons per person. By 2050, it's going to be about nine tons per person. And remember, their pledge is, they said they're going to peak emissions in 2030. And their emissions are going to peak at about 10 million metric tons. 10 million metric tons, I'm sorry. So I think that, and by that time, their emissions per capita would be going to go from eight to nine tons per person. So to think that the Chinese are going to reduce their emissions from eight to nine tons per person to 2.4 tons per person quite frankly preposterous. It's not going to happen. And that's why you never see developing countries uh, entering into an agreement that would compel them to cut emissions to such steep levels by 2050. We'll go to the last slide. I think it's the last slide. And this is just coal-fired power stations. Now, what I mentioned earlier, uh, they were building with abandon. Look at China, China and India alone, just two countries alone. And they have uh, well over 1,100 coal-fired power plants in land. So when people talk about a carbon-constrained world, I look at a chart like this and say, I don't see the carbon-constrained world. I see carbon-constrained regions, but I don't see the carbon-constrained world. Uh, and I think, do we have one more? Okay. One last slide, just to give you a, a, 
a perspective on how difficult it is to achieve emission reductions. When I was back at the Power of Energy, we did slide very interesting slide like, well, how big is a gigaton? So when you think about the U.S. power sector, it, it, it makes about two gigatons a year of greenhouse gas emissions. So if you wanted to cut greenhouse gas emissions, eliminate entirely greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector in the U.S., how would you go about doing that? Well, let's say you wanted to do it half of it with nuclear power plants. You wanted to eliminate one gigaton of emissions from nuclear power plants. You would have to build 108, 28, one gigawatt of nuclear power plants. That's more than all the power plants that are operating in, operating in the United States today. If you want to do it with wind energy, you get one gigaton reduction from wind power, you would have to build over 190,000 megawatt Yes, It's a huge amount. So when people talk politically that we're going to be able to reduce emissions, you know, it's going to be easy to do, it's not going to cost a lot, it's not going to cost jobs, uh, this chart belies that. This chart tells you that you really have to build a whole bunch of stuff if you're going to be able to reduce emissions in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world for that matter. And I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Steve. Um, could you just tell them uh, in one or two sentences what the INDC is? Yeah, the INDC is something that all countries are going to be submitting to Paris. It's called the Intended Nationally Determined Contribution. It's essentially an indication bill for, uh, for the country's supply. So the U.S. has submitted his, uh, it, it, it says its goal is 26 to 28% reduction in equity not cash emissions by 2025. The Chinese have submitted theirs. They say they're going to peak emissions. Uh, by 2030, the Indians have submitted theirs. Theirs is an intensity uh, goal, which essentially means what they're going to do is they're going to slow the rate of increase, but they're not going to stop increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the Europeans have, have offered a 40 percent reduction by 2030. So there are different benchmarks, there are different goals. Uh, the goals are phrased different ways, but these are all supposed to be. Now, when you add them all up, they're supposed to be what, uh, what the treaty in Paris will guarantee as far as emission reductions. But there's still a lot of questions about what the INDCs actually mean, how they're going to be implemented, and what legal force they have. And it still wouldn't result in a reduction of global temperatures or maintain uh, 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 And we, uh, many, there have been a, a number of analysis, analyses of the INDCs today. I, uh, the International Energy, Energy Agency has done one, a number of other folks and think tanks have done one. I've taken a look at the numbers, and uh, if you add them all, up all the INDCs today, it will not result in emission reductions, emissions globally by 2030. Which goes poorly <coughs> for the polar centers that are out there swimming around. Um, I'd like to next um, introduce my colleague from Heritage, David Kreutzer. He's a senior research fellow in energy economics and climate change. Uh, before coming to Heritage, he taught economics at James Madison University and Ohio University. And he earned his PhD at George Mason. Uh, David's research has appeared in journals such as the Journal of Political Economy, the National <coughs> Tax Journal, Economic Inquiry, uh, the Southern Economic Journal, Applied Economics, and the Journal of Energy and Development. Uh, he's also uh, engaged in some local uh, politics, having served as the mayor uh, and town councilman in Dayton, Virginia a town of about 1,200 people in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, David, thanks for coming today. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the introduction and, and that political involvement. I hope that the tense was past perfect and I'm no longer doing it today. But, uh, Steve, I want to thank you. That was a great introduction. It really uh, lays the groundwork for what, what I'm going to say. I don't have any slides because I'm, what I have to say, if I had slides, would give a, an impression of false accuracy on the, on the numbers. What we've seen is that we're going to have to be cutting a lot of energy. All right? It's not cutting CO2 without cutting energy just isn't going to happen. We're going to cut a lot of energy. You know, there'll be some replacement of CO2, low CO2, and, and no CO2 energy, but not enough to come anywhere close to replacing what we're getting rid of. And we'll be getting rid of the most affordable energy. And so we, we, all economists know what impact getting rid of the most affordable energy will do to the economy. It will make it worse will drive up power prices, will make production costs go higher, <coughs> make people spend more on their utility bills, they'll have less to spend on the things that the manufacturers are producing. The manufacturers higher costs, they can't lower it to meet the, the reduced budget of the consumers. So we're gonna to have to produce less stuff. And 
the economy will contract compared to what it would have been. We will have fewer jobs than what we would have had, and income will go down. And this is not denier economics, all right? This is not arch conservative economics. Um, back probably before many of you were in, in, uh, in college, I don't know, you look like a young group to me, um, with the Waxman Markey debate. Some of you definitely remember it, some of you may not. <coughs> we had a panel at the Heritage Foundation with economists from the Brookings Institution, from the, I mean, from the Heritage Foundation, and economists from the EPA, from the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, and I think from the CBO, as well as the National Black Chamber of Commerce. And there was a debate about the impact of the Waxman Markey Bill on the economy. None of them argued that it would be beneficial. All right, the debate was over how much income would be lost, how many jobs would be lost. So the direction is very clear. Um, and the magnitudes are fairly consistent. We, if we're looking at the Paris Agreement, nobody's really analyzed what that would cost, mainly because we don't really know what would be involved. Steve laid out even the stuff the administration has proposed falls 45% short of the goals that we're claiming we're going to meet. All right. But if we look at certain policies like the Clean Power Plan, or if we look at the cap and trade like we did with Waxman Markey, we look at some of these other major bills, but not comprehensive enough, the numbers are fairly consistent. If you look at a decade's worth of losses, it's usually trillions of dollars. Trillion, maybe two trillion, depending on which bill we're looking at. Um, on the, the employment shortfalls, now the employment relative to what it would have been without any of these policies, it varies, sometimes it's way below, sometimes it comes back up. So we look at the, the maximum shortfall, and there will be years on, almost under any of these policies where employment will fall hundreds of thousands below what it would have been without the damaging policy, sometimes millions, all right? So the, the significant loss in jobs, significant loss in income. Um, and, you know, Typically, the numbers would be like $150 billion a year. With Waxman Markey, it was 300 was the average loss, okay? But let's put a perspective on that, a weather perspective or a climate perspective. Uh, for the past 100 years or so, on average, there have been two hurricanes that make landfall in the U.S. Now, for the past decade, we haven't had any that were category three or higher, so we're sort of in a drought right now. But overall, it's about two per year. We can look where they're a little bit ahead of us, if you want to put ahead in scare quotes. Europe, all right? I don't know if you remember when President Obama, in his first term, he held up Spain as a model of green energy that we should be following. They were winning the race. We were behind, shame on us. We need to do more like them. Well, their economy tanked, in part because of the green energy. But if they believed green energy was as good for the economy as our president thought it was, when their economy starts tanking, they would have doubled down. They would have said, we need more of this great economy promoting green energy. Instead, they, they backed off dramatically. They started taxing the people that they'd given tax breaks to before. Same thing with Germany. Germany couldn't, simply couldn't even integrate the rooftop solar that they had paid billions and billions and billions to subsidize. So they, they slashed their subsidy rate. Great Britain is doing a 180 on their green energy policies. And there's a good reason for that. We can look. The cost that we've talked about in dollars is sometimes abstract and hard to understand. I did in terms of hurricanes. But if you look at it in terms of human cost, it's significant. Great Britain, this is not a third world country, right? Their energy prices had gone up dramatically from the green energy subsidies that, that had to be paid by the rate payers, which is typically how you do it. And their estimates of the excess winter deaths from energy poverty in Great Britain, again, we're, we're, we're not talking about a third world country. We're in the thousands for the past couple of years. Okay, thousands of people died. Pensioners were, and they said, and then they had a much larger drop. They said, here's what happens if we have, you know, Plan X or whatever, I can't remember what they called it, and then there's a footnote, you'll go down. And the plan required the developing world, China, India, Haiti, all of those countries, to get back to their 2000 level of emissions by 2050. And these countries had uh, emissions that were maybe 5% of what the US had. It's just not gonna happen. They're not, as I said, gonna sign up for the eternal poverty plan. L let's look at Haiti, all right? In 2010, Haiti's consumption of electricity 
was 25 kilowatt hours per year. Now, this is not residential consumption. This is across the whole country. If you have a space heater that has, probably has three settings, like 600, 900, and 1500, you run it at that middle one for a, a day, and you put it come pretty close to the total per capita patient consumption of electricity, including commercial, including industrial. Now, to expect them to go back to that level is just ludicrous. Right? It's the equivalent of electricity of 28 pounds of coal, a bucket of coal. So you get a bucket of coal, all right, the U.S. at that time, 20, 2010, consumed about 13,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. The developing world in total, on average, is about 300. As, as Steve pointed out, they're simply, they're not going to volunteer to go back to that. Okay? And, it, and I think it's immoral to expect them or to pressure them to do that. Okay? So that, the, the thing is, the, the, the climate policy will be very expensive. The me measure per decade will be in trillions of dollars. It will, it will cost jobs, it will have no impact on world temperatures unless we somehow can force an immoral bargain on the development. Thank you, David. And, um, you know, the game that will be played in Paris is that all of these poor countries, the developing countries of the world, and there's, what, 160 plus that we consider to be, like, developing countries, they're going to pretend that they're going to reduce their levels to that amount in return for our promise of the billions of dollars that go into the Green Climate Fund, $100 billion a year by 2020 and $100 billion a year every year after uh, 2020. So uh, that, that's the game, that's the little dance that's going to happen in, in Paris is that Haiti and other countries will say, well, sure, we're, we're, we'll reduce our emissions uh, to those levels. Uh, partially because of the money you're going to be giving us because we'll do um, green climate projects that will, will reduce our emissions. But of course, you first. You, uh, you fund these things first and then we'll worry about mitigating our uh, getting on this eternal poverty plan that you talked about. Um, our final uh, panelist today is Meyer Ebel. Uh, he, <coughs> he's the director of the Center for Energy and Environment at Competitive Enterprise Institute. He also chairs the Cooler Heads Coalition, who is the co-sponsor with Heritage of our briefing today. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, and uh, all I'll say about Meyer is that in ranking him third in his global list of the 10 most respected global warming skeptics, uh, the Business Insider commented, quote, Meyer Evil may be enemy number one to the current climate change community. And I think that's pretty high praise. Uh, so Meyer, uh, Thank you, Steve, uh, and I want to thank uh, the Heritage Foundation for co-sponsoring this uh, briefing along with the Cooler Heads Coalition. Uh, the Cooler Heads Coalition was created in 1997 uh, at the time that the Kyoto Protocol was being negotiated. Uh, it consists of over two dozen nonprofit groups that question global warming alarmism and oppose energy ration policies. Uh, our Three public products of this coalition are these types of briefings, which we've held going back starting in 1998, I believe, when Marlo Lewis, my colleague at CDI, was the founding chairman of the Cooler Heads Coalition. Uh, we also publish a newsletter, and you have a copy of that on your chair, uh, the Cooler Heads Digest, and you can subscribe to that newsletter at the, our other main product, uh, globalwarming.org, uh, a blog of that covers the field of uh, climate and energy policy. <clears throat> I also want to thank the House Science Committee for holding us, uh, letting us use the room and, and hosting us, uh, particularly Chris Schenck and Brian Corcoran and Chairman Lamar Smith. Uh, now, I'm going to cover a little bit of the same ground because I want to emphasize uh, what Steve Uly and David Kreutzer have said about the how important the Paris climate treaty is. Now, a lot of people say, well, it can't be important because the U.S. demands that it not be legally binding. But I want to quote what is in the current negotiating text. It goes back to the when the Durban platform was first set up a few years ago to, to create the Paris Treaty. It, the Paris uh, COP will end with the adoption of, quote, a protocol, another legal instrument, or another outcome with legal force under the framework convention applicable to all parties. Now, that to me is a treaty. 
It's the same as the Kyoto Protocol, which uh, everybody in 1997 and 1998 understood was a treaty. And so uh, I think we're going to uh, have that fight. I think the Senate will lead that fight, but I think the House uh, will play a role. So uh, let's go to the next slide after that. <laughs> one of those miracle energy saving devices <laughs> the Department of Energy requires that we all have. Um, I had one last week when we did the Senate briefing on my cell phone, which which turned off Steve Gross's bio. So, uh, I get an extra minute. Talk amongst yourselves. No, uh, well, look, I'm going to say a few things about the science. I'm going to start out with the science. That is, why are we doing this? And, uh, and without the slides, I won't be able to remember. So. <laughs> Should we take questions on the first two? Here. Sure, we're still at yes. stage one of three. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know. It's not a yeah, yeah, kind of yeah, but I think that's a good idea. Uh, one thing I would like to ask you guys, well, you all are thinking of your questions, is, um, you know, Steve Uli has shown that there is, that the Paris Climate Treaty, whatever it turns out to be, is really not going to accomplish the total goal, and the U.S. INDC, that our contribution is not going to, uh, so far, even accomplish what the Paris Climate Treaty says. So, <coughs> I just like to emphasize have you guys talk about the fact that this is just phase one uh, of yeah yeah it is phase one uh, there's there's gonna be a lot more to come but I, I, I I'm gonna pivot on that and, and bring something else that I think is kind of interesting but when you talk about the Paris Agreement I'm just focused on the mitigation goals of the main players what China mission got to play to look like what the is going to look like what the EU is going to look like there's there's a whole that are very vague, you come from development banks, you come from a whole, uh, all, all over the world, but it's the financial institution. But the important point is, is that developing countries are not going to agree to any of this unless they see money on the table. For them, it's always been government to government. Well, could, could you mention uh, India? What did you say? And India, I mean, India, India, if you look at India's INDC, it's very interesting. They say that they're going to uh, commit to uh, improving their uh, CO2 intensity, that, that's in my commission said it will be a uh, net per unit of GDP by 2025% 20, by 2030, and they have a whole host of other things in there. And then when they get to the end of the thing, they say, well, by the way, we're not going to be able to do this without uh, finance for the developed countries. And then, oh, the price tag we figure is about $2.5 trillion in India's goal. Even if India's goal is met, its emissions will, will induce for about $2 to two billion metric tons. Anywhere between five and six billion metric tons. So that's even with the pledge by 2030, Indian emissions are going to be probably five to six billion metric tons. So this is astonishing, and, and even to get to that level, uh, they're saying it would cost the developed, the developed world about two and a half trillion dollars. I don't think that's going to fly quite frankly. And so I, you know, I, I think when, when you consider what the House can do, I mean, you, you're the ones that the House is, is one of the bodies that appropriates the money. Right? And if there's no money on the table in Paris, I think that's going to put the administration, and, and I think it's going to put other countries quite frankly, uh, in a very, very precarious position. Can I just have, um, I did a brief calculation, found the different sources, so I, don't, I wouldn't bet my life on it, but looking at GDP for India in 2005, the base year, and then in 2030, when they're going to meet this intensity reduction, and projected CO2 emissions on the business as usual. <laughs> even without, even just the business as usual, because their economy grows more than their CO2 emissions, they, they meet this intensity reduction. That is, they've made a pledge to do exactly what they're going to do anyway, as far as I can tell. Second, Myron asks, you know, we, we have to look at these things. We, 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 we sometimes get caught up analyzing the current policy that's being proposed. When we realize that these will be a continuing set of policies ever ratcheting down CO2 emissions, 
then it becomes clear that we're not doing something for our grandchildren. We're doing something to them. How, how would it, it's always often, well, we, you don't care about your children or your grandchildren, we need to have this policy and so they'll have a word, world worth living in, blah, 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 blah. All right? These costs get higher and higher the further down the road you go. How is it that we're helping them by setting a policy that says they have to have a world where they can consume less energy than we get to consume? And moreover, the, uh, the, the current negotiating text, and by the way, you can look on the chronology that's on your chair, which I uh, fiddled with this morning. The current negotiating text, the, the uh, web address is there. That text says that every five years, the convention will renew the, the INDCs, the indices, the nationally determined contributions, and decide what needs to be done according to the current science and how things are going. So every five years, this is going to ratchet down. So people who say, oh, well, the, this, this treaty is not legally binding, well, let's see what happens the first time the convention says, well, we're, the U.S. has to do more. So uh, how are we doing here? Ah, okay, well, I'll just give my talk. Yes. Ah, here's Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, thank you for your patience. Um, while he's doing that, um, you know, just from a, I'm a lawyer, I understand about half what's coming out of Steve Ewing's mouth on this. Um, but from a legal standpoint, what's really fascinating is they're going to go over there and make this international agreement, what I, what I would consider a treaty, um, making all these commitments that now that we've heard from the experts won't work, won't amount to uh, reducing the carbon emissions to a point where the global temperature uh, stabilizes. Then on top of it, they're going to take that agreement and not give it to the House for its approval or to the Senate for its approval. And then afterwards, every five years, they'll have us put a new commitment out there and then also not go to the House or Senate. Brian, can we, or that can we start at the beginning? Yes. That's sort of the, the, my slight level. One, one point that we said sort of tangential but it needs to be emphasized, the, the data do not show us heading to catastrophe. Yeah, right? David, so, uh, on that point, let me begin. Okay. Uh, next. Okay, so why are we doing all this? Well, there's a debate here. The alarmists say we're doing it to save the planet, and those of us who are skeptical of that, who might call realists, say, let's look at the data. So let me show you a little data. This is what's been going on with atmospheric CO2 concentrations. They've been going up every year. They're now at about 400 parts per million. <clears throat> Interestingly, about one-third of all the CO2 emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the century have occurred since the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in 1992. About one third. Keep that in mind. Next slide. So what's happened to the temperature? Here's the satellite temperature. We've had a little bit of warming since 1979. Next slide. Here's the surface temperature from what I think is the best uh, compilation by Hadley and CRU. Since 1996, you don't see much warming there. Yet since 1992, we've had one-third of all the CO2 emissions that human beings have produced since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Next slide. So here is what the debate is about. It's a debate between models and reality. The IPCC models are all of those spaghetti lines. The dark line is the average. The squares and the circles are the balloon data and the satellite data. You see there's very close agreement between the balloon and satellite data. So, to my mind, we've already averted the crisis. That is, we've pumped a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and we have seen that the climate is not nearly as sensitive to CO2 as the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is part of the UNFCCC claim. Next. So what do the alarmists do when confronted with this discrepancy or divergence? They readjust the data. So the top line is what the US temperature was before the folks at Goddard 
Institute for Space Studies got a hold of it. And afterwards, you'll see that the 1930s, which were as hot as today in the original data set, are now, uh, that, those temperatures are now cooler, considerably cooler than what we have today. And moreover, they've, they've made our current temperatures warmer than the original data set. Next. So what, we can talk, I, I have about 50 slides on impacts. I'm going to show you one. This is global death rates due to extreme weather events. The, the small red uh, graphs are per capita deaths. You're down to five per million due to, due to extreme weather events. So that's been going down, 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 and there's no evidence that it's going up, despite what you read in the newspaper headlines. Next. But what has been going up as CO2 has gone up, the, the bottom is the global mean temperature, the middle is CO2, and the top is food production. Why is that? Next. Because CO2 is necessary for plants to photosynthesize solar energy and turn it into calories that we can eat. This is an example of a controlled lab experiment of adding CO2 the same type of tree, the same size to begin with, and after a few years, you'll see how much bigger the one with, with added CO2 is. Next. And this, if lots of studies have been done, and you'll see that for the principal grain groups and other food uh, crops, adding CO2 increases production. There's hundreds of studies that, that confirm this. Next. So, what is at stake in the Paris Climate Talks. This is a graph of the U.S. long-term economic growth of about 3% per annum from 1965 to 2007. You subtract 1% population growth, so you really get about 2% annual economic growth. Next. But since the financial crisis of 2008, we have not gotten back onto that path for the first time since old well, for many, many decades. We have not gotten back onto it. Now, why is that next? One of the reasons is federal regulations. This is from my colleague Wayne Cruz's annual 10,000 commandments, a regulatory snap, a snapshot of the regulatory state. Uh, you'll see that environment, environmental regulations are the biggest component of the regulatory burden on the U.S. economy. These are identified costs. These, these do not include opportunity costs. These do not include businesses and investments and jobs that are not created as a result of regulations. So it doesn't include somebody who decides not to start a business or some company that decides to put its investment outside of this country. Next. So here are the average costs on medium size firms of uh, under 50 people, it's uh, environmental regulations are $3,500 a year per, per, per employee. Next. Here, here is a chart that shows the regulatory costs per family. You'll see that regulation is this would be that if it were part of the family budget, if you were billed for it, it would be the second largest cost after housing. Next. So, in 2011, the House Oversight Committee asked 600 and some businesses, trade associations, and groups like Heritage and CEI, what was the biggest obstacle to economic growth? 51% of the responses named the Environmental Protection Agency as the principal obstacle to environmental growth. The principal obstacle. Next. But that was before Obama got going. Right? That's before all the stuff we're talking about. The new source performance standards for, for greenhouse gas emissions from, from new power plants, the so-called clean power plant. The ESPS, the existing source performance standard. The forthcoming methane rules. Plus the new ozone rule, which is perhaps more expensive even than uh, the uh, greenhouse gas rules. And there's more. Next. So let's compare what's going on in states that have already adopted these energy duration policies, these climate policies, with states that have not. California electricity is now 18 cents per kilowatt hour 
or 13 cents if you're an industrial user. Why do industrial users pay less? Well, because they sign contracts that say if there's a power shortage, uh, we can turn off your power. Right? So they get a cheaper deal. Texas, it's 11.6 cents, and it's only 5.7 cents for industrial users. So that is a lot less than California. Indiana is similar. So my point is that we can already see what's going on if we look at the states that have already adopted the Obama climate agenda, the Paris agenda. And if you look at California's economy, they have not only the highest electric rates in the country, they have some of the worst economic performance. They are only rivaled by states like New York and the New England states, which have also adopted these policies. They have destroyed their manufacturing base, which used to be considered. They've sent it to places like Indiana, which have cheap electricity. Next. So, the Paris Climate Treaty, why is it important if the Obama administration insists that it's not legally binding and that it doesn't need to be submitted to the Center for Ratification? Well, it will be used. Once they have signed the Paris Climate Treaty, they'll come back and tell the courts, the Congress, and the next president, hey, you've got to do this. We made an international commitment. We can't go back on our word. <coughs> we, we have seen this work with other agreements over and over again. So I expect it will work with Paris. Uh, their argument will be, you know, look, we've made these international commitments, so this these things now have the force of law, even though they're just rulemaking under the Clean Air Act. And as we pointed out, there's a five-year review clause. Every five years, the Paris Climate Treaty will be reviewed for revision, depending on the circumstances. Well, look at the EPA. Do they ever decide that we, the science shows that we need, uh, we can relax the limits on a pollutant? No. We always have to ratchet it down, because unless we ratchet it down, the purpose for our regulatory existence disappears. Next. So what should the House do? Uh, Representative Ed Whitfield uh, today is introducing or has introduced resolutions of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act. Senators McConnell and Capito will do the same thing in the Senate this week. I believe votes are planned fairly shortly. It is absolutely essential that these, these resolutions be voted on. People say, well, President Obama will, will veto. Well, first of all, we don't know that. I expect he will. But in the second place, it is extremely important that the negotiators that working towards the Paris Climate Treaty understand that what the president has committed to under the US INDC is not worth the paper it's printed on. It's his promise. It's not the promise of the Congress or the federal government or the American people. The CRA votes will, will demonstrate that, and it is critical that these votes occur. <clears throat> Similarly, the Interior EPA bill has several riders prohibiting all this junk. Those need to be, be maintained. Now, the, the current, the current uh, CR ex, uh, book expires on the 11th of December. The, the Paris climate negotiations, the COP is due to conclude on the 11th of November, It'll probably go on to so, all this is still up in the air because you haven't settled on an omnibus yet. It is important that the House and the Senate uh, continue to insist on these riders being taken from the interior EPA bill to the, to the omnibus. Finally, uh, there's, there's a rider in the House bill, not in that it was taken out of the Senate bill, in the Senate State Department appropriation, the House State Department appropriations bill to prohibit funding for the Green Climate Fund. This is, again, very important because it sends a message to the developing countries, the group of G77, 135 countries that want the cash, they want to know where the cash is, that the U.S. isn't going to provide the cash. And finally, I would encourage the House to insist and do not follow the Senate Finance Committee Bill of Tax Cuts. Do not reauthorize or renew the wind production tax credit. Because the wind production tax credit is what is necessary to make the, the, the greenhouse gas rules work. Because if the states are going to be required to switch from coal to renewables, they're not going to be able to afford it unless 
the federal taxpayer is paying. So uh, I would say these are the things I think you need to do. There's some other stuff you could do, but I think each one of these is absolutely essential. Thank you very much. Thanks, Myra. Um, we are running up against, I think, uh, an end time here. So let's just go and see if there are any uh, questions from uh, from you from you both from you guys. Any questions come to mind, y'all? Just Showing the, the 
difference between uh, electricity rates in, in Texas and Indiana versus California. We we'll take a look at what you, in, in, in the rates for uh, industrial rates for electricity, industrial rates for natural gas, and industrial rates for coal in, in the U.S. and Canada versus other OECD countries, which is most of us in Europe, which are two to four times cheaper here in the United States. That's a huge, huge competitive advantage. So we start reading the press in Europe, seeing a lot of European countries announce we're not going to invest in Europe anymore because the energy costs are just just too great. Uh, we've seen in the UK, we've seen steel manufacturers shepherd. Uh, the UK is going to be out of steel industry before, uh, before too long. So what we're seeing is uh, the impacts of the Europeans' policy choices. And these were these were policy choices that were made in Europe. Coming home to roost, uh, energy intensive industrial manufacturing in the <coughs> endangered species. And when they look for places, these companies look for places to relocate. They're looking at China. They're looking and the question is, why would we throw that away? It's a huge advantage we have. Thank you, Steve. Uh, do we have any more uh, questions before we uh, take off here? One up front here? Uh, is there anyone who can copy that whole PowerPoint? Sure. <coughs> Just give us your email address. All right, so. this, this is being videotaped, and it will appear on the web as well. And it will be available on globalwarming.org and probably on Eric. Just come up later so you can give, uh, give us your, your email address. Thank you. And, and if you want the uh, 